hardest part though was you know GoDaddy's a public company, so yes. we have to keep it very quiet, even from our employees. So do our they, employees do they... did not know until the day of when we told them. And uh, we were coached very well to say, you know, the first thing you need to make sure you say after that is, don't worry, you all have your jobs. Nobody's yeah. getting fired. Yeah. Because that's what people are waiting for. And right. They're not going to hear anything else until they hear that. What's tomorrow look like? Yep. So we said that and reiterated that. Same the office, office, higher pay. And by the way, we have 20 GoDaddy people waiting to party. So let's go. This is Startup to Storefront, the podcast where we talk to business owners and entrepreneurs about the untold challenges of scaling a business. All right, welcome to the podcast. We're here with Brian Nolan. Brian Nolan's a successful tech entrepreneur, sold his company Celebrate to GoDaddy. Uh, if people who don't know, GoDaddy is probably the largest web hosting company in the world, or one of them. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So let, let's start with the startup. What was the idea like? So you, you're, what, were you doing something related to Celebrate and then you decided to go out on your own or how did the idea come about? Let me tell you what Celebrate does first. It'll yeah. make more sense. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrate is a software, web-based software that helps small brands and retailer, retailers sell their products on the online marketplaces like Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and so forth. So my co-founder and I worked together in Pasadena at an online retailer. I was in charge of selling our products on the marketplaces. So through our own pain points, basically, and experience of how do we get our products listed on Amazon and eBay and everywhere? How do we fulfill the orders? How do we make sure the inventory is in sync? So if we sell something here, it doesn't oversell again. Right. We looked at, at the software that was available at the time, and it was expensive and old, a lot of like desktop clunky solutions. Yeah, clunky. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we just felt like there was a need for a, a smaller, easier to use solution for small businesses. Now, at the same time, on the side, I had my own little side hustle called okay. Top Bargains with a couple other friends, actually, where we were buying excess and overstock inventory um, and selling it online. So Specifically example, on eBay and Amazon? Just on the marketplaces. We didn't even have Got our it. own website. Okay. So, for example, the first thing we bought was 1,100 pairs of baseball cleats that we got from a guy who bought them from Dick's Sporting Goods when they had overpurchased for the season. Wow. So, so you're flipping these these things. Yeah. So he gets them from Dick's for like $2 a pair. Okay. We get them for like $4 a pair. And we're talking about like Nike, A-Rod. Sure. You know, Adidas, Reebok, whatever. What are you listing them for? 40 bucks. You know, they retail for 120 MSRP or more sometimes for the A-Rod ones. And we're listing them for 40, 50 bucks. So massive margins. Yeah. And flying through and selling. Then we, then we got some other apparel. We got really anything that we could get our hands on where it's almost like real estate where you're, you're making money on the buy and buying it for super cheap. And just as long as it was small enough and a brand name that people were going to be searching for and looking for, uh, we would buy it and, and resell it. And I was doing it as a side hustle. So I'd come home from my job during the day where I was also selling on the marketplaces and then trying to manage this business. And trying to figure out how do I get my sales into QuickBooks? How do I, we started using fulfillment by Amazon yep. um, to sell, to, to fulfill these orders. Because uh, Amazon offers that even for non-Amazon orders. You can have any order. Yeah. And couldn't find any software that automated any of this. So for, people, so for people who don't know, I kind of have a little bit of experience with this. Yeah. We had a, a company and the whole thing is you. So if someone comes to your website and they order it, you obviously probably, let's just make it easy. You have a closet full of this black item. You grab it, you mail it yourself. Right. Now your company's maybe in year two and you're thinking, let me go to Amazon. When you go to Amazon, you have to fill out this super complicated Excel sheet with a certain SKU, item description, price, and then a photo that's a super specific size for Amazon. It's a pain. Right. If you're really good, you get it done. If you're like me, you're on the phone with Amazon, an Amazon specialist figuring this out. And that's just one marketplace. But now you have two areas of inventory to manage, right? You have your online store and also Amazon. Right. And so you guys were sort of figuring this out, but with eBay and everybody else. Yeah, we were figuring out first how to automate some of the basic tasks. And we launched sort of a precursor product to Cellbrite back in 2012. So this was like 2011. Mike, my co-founder and I were talking about this. We put in some money together built this precursor 
product that just automated the fulfillment by Amazon piece. So mm -hmm. that we could manually list our products on eBay or whatever and have them fulfilled automatically. What was Amazon like in 2011? They were growing really fast. They had about only about... Um, eBay three. was still the player, right? eBay? Surprisingly, eBay is still a player now. Okay. I mean, Amazon, of course, is much, much larger, but worldwide eBay is still a very big player in this space. But Amazon, you know, maybe they were right around 30%, maybe a little less of the sales on Amazon were from third parties. Now okay. it's well over 50%. So it's just a little bit different. This is right when fulfillment by Amazon was getting going. Um, so they were begging people to kind of put some inventory in there and try it out. Prices were really cheap. So we automated some of these features and we get some feedback from our customers. And again, this is still all side hustle. Sure. Getting feedback from our customers of, this is great that I can automate the fulfillment, but how do I get my products on eBay or how do I get them on Etsy or whatever? And so we started thinking, okay, we, we need to build a full suite end to end solution of list your products, sync inventory, then fulfill it when you get orders and you know, everything. Yeah. That's where it, yeah, that's where it started. So in 2013, we um, raised some money from an incubator in Pasadena called Idea Lab. And Idea Lab is one of the very first incubators in the world. They started in 1996. They created the concept of pay-per-click advertising or paid search, which is essentially what the Google Sure, models. that's amazing. You know, a bunch of other companies have come out of there. So we got some money from them. How much did they give you? So or they initially invested 250000 in, ex but in exchange for in exchange for equity, like six percent, or is it less? Uh, than it was higher because okay. they came in pretty early. Pre, it was more of like idea stage. So we had this other product first that just did this one piece of functionality, and we were only charging like twenty nine dollars or forty nine dollars. But we went to Idea Lab and said, "Hey, we think if we build this full suite, people are going to want to pay two hundred fifty bucks a month for this." Yeah, and they said, "Well." Prove it. <laughs> we didn't have, didn't have that proof. We sure. knew people would pay this. So what they did, as I said, we'll give you fifty thousand now. You take six weeks to go find a way to prove that this model works, mm -hmm. and then you can spend money on Google advertising and so forth and drive traffic. And then we'll give you the other two hundred. So we did the full on lean startup methodology and set up a website for Sellbrite explaining what our vision was and what everything was, but made it look like it was real and live. Yeah. Had our pricing page up there that had three different plans. And when you click on it to sign up, we would tell you it's coming soon and you can sign up for the beta and get a, you know, start building a waiting list basically. Nice. And we would track which price plan they clicked on. And so yeah. we had all this data. So you had like the LOI set. And so you go, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So and you're like, this is the interest. Of the 50K on Google ads to sure. go drive traffic to it. So we proved two things. We, by the way, we've got a hundred people signed up in a very short amount of time. By the end of it, before we launched the product, we had about 2000 people on our waiting list. Wow. Forward. So that's significant. That's amazing. We proved, yeah. We proved that we could scale it with cost effectively with Google advertising and, and other means, and also proved that people are willing to pay 250 bucks a month. Nowadays, our pricing starts way lower. $49 a month. Sure. Um, because we're able to do it at scale. Right. And we want to, you know, we're really targeting smaller businesses. How long were you in the accelerator program? So we worked out of there. It's not, yeah. It's, it's like an incubator? Than like Ycom or any of those where okay. it's a set time frame. It's okay. more of an incubator where you kind of go in there. They provide all the HR and, and finance and accounting and Legal. payroll and things like all the operational. Yep departments and you just focus on your product and marketing yep. and getting out there. Um, and they give you the office space and everything. So we actually stayed there for a couple of years we were okay. in the space until we were at about 10 employees or so. And then we moved out and got our own. Oh, wow. So you went from space. just you two plus employees in this space. Yeah. That's amazing. And you're working on it the whole time, 18 hours a day, yep. kind of a By thing. By that point, once they invest the money, we quit our day jobs. <laughs> and yeah. And, went through this. and a funny story on that too is that so I was working at that point I had left the online retailer and was actually working at a different company and I just kind of felt like the idea lab money was going to come in we hadn't gotten the commitment yet so I gave three weeks notice and on the last day is when idea lab committed the money wow and uh, I kind of feel like 
know, it's one of those things where you kind of feel you like it wouldn't it? have happened if I didn't. Put, yeah. Like if I didn't put it all on the line. Um, this is how I feel. I tell everyone to quit their jobs yeah. because when you have when that happens and you focus on something, I think serendipity and or you know willing things into existence. Totally. Which I, and I'm not that way. I'm not that kind of guy. But it always happens. You'll figure it out. Way. You. Right. And were you living with your co-founder or were you guys? No, we were, uh, we lived near each other. We okay. We were buddies and we would go to bars all the time and hang out all the time. And if you're familiar with the Studio City area, we did a lot of our uh, early uh, pitch deck and things like that at Laurel Tavern on Ventura uh, or on my dining room table is where we did a lot of the work in the beginning. That's awesome. So we would go both do our day jobs and come home and work basically after dinner till 10 or midnight or something like that. And it was like, so you have 10 employees in this, uh, at the, at the incubator and now it's time to get your own space or are you raising, are you raising money? A second round, your seed round? Yeah. So we're trying to, we made several attempts. We actually never raised VC money. Oh, interesting. Company. We've raised, we raised money from idea lab and some angel investors and that was it. Not, not for, you know, lack of trying. We actually did try. What was the biggest pushback you guys had? The biggest pushback was I think just. We were pretty early in the whole marketplace, Amazon boom. So early on, you know, Idea Labs and Bill Gross, I got to give them credit. They're really good at seeing the future and like seeing the vision of, of ideas. Mm-hmm. That's why they're successful. When we went and pitched the VCs, a lot of them thought this is a niche of a niche and it's like tiny and it's never going to be anything because who sells on Amazon or eBay and, you know, it's like, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And, and were, were you trying to raise everywhere? San Francisco? Yeah. We were going yeah, to New York. in LA. Talked to every uh, VC here in LA and many of them up in San Francisco as well. And even a couple in New York. And all of them couldn't see it. Yeah, we got pretty close with a few. We actually went out two different times. I think the first time, I think one of the problems too was our timing was a little off. So the first time we went out, we were still a little too small in terms of our monthly recurring revenue. Yep. And they would say, well, come back when you're at, I think we we're at maybe like 30K. And they said, come back when you're at 50K. Yeah. But that was always a moving target because when we got to 50, they're like, come back when you're at 80. <laughs> so that was, I think, their way of just sort of keeping their foot in the door and not saying no, but not saying yes either. And saying, well, let's see how this goes, right? They're trying to reduce risk. Totally. It's their job. Right. So the more traction you can show them and grow, the better. But we were pretty close, though, with a couple firms from LA where, you know, we've gone through several rounds, met the entire partner and the team and everybody and just couldn't get them over the edge. Ended up being a blessing for us. Totally. Retaining much of the equity in the company. There's no board. You're not, you're right? Yeah. Well, we had two members from Idea Lab on the board. Okay. But, I mean, they were super easy to work with and really had our back. And, you know, there wasn't like we were answering to them or had to get approval or anything really from them. Yeah. Um, they really were there to support us, which was great. And what year was it when you were raising? Let's see. So Idea Lab funded in 2013. We probably went back out in 2014. Okay. And then again in like 2016 or so. So the metrics today are kind of like, um, if you have 1.2, right, million in, in annual recurring revenue, that's kind of good for your Series A. Was it the same then or was it, is that what they were looking for? Yeah. Well, and it's funny because it differs here in LA than it does in San Francisco. San oh. Francisco, the checks are usually bigger. They want to see a little more traction. Okay. A series C, a seed series or a series A even might be, you know, two or $3 million in LA where it's really about $5 million in San Francisco, which Shh. it was at the time. So got it. Uh, kind of depends. Like they're smaller firms here, right? They don't have as big of funds. And so they're writing smaller checks. And, um, Interesting. So that's where we were getting caught up to because at one point, right. I think the second time we went out, we were trying to raise like three and a half million. And it was like, so for seed investors are like, well, that's too much. We invest a million to two million. Here in LA. Even here in LA. Yeah. yeah. Both places, but, and then okay. the Series A, we're like, that's too little. We were only like, you need to be raising five million or more, five or six million. Or something. So right. we were kind of, that was our mistake. I mean, we tried to, the, our timing was off. I think we, you know, we just didn't try to raise at the right time in the company. Um, and your valuation, did they help you out internally? Yeah. I mean, that wasn't really a sticking point. Okay. Um, I think we did pretty good there. There's so Our many people. investors did really well, right? Because they got That's in. great. Yeah. We had some investors that were in before Idea Lab, even. 
as angel investors. Um, and they did really well with the acquisition. And even our most current investors, angel investors, did, did well. well. Yeah, the, the valuation piece, we messed up on the valuation piece. And so we were like overinflated at the beginning, which means when you go to raise a Series A, you either face with the down round or you have to, the revenue has to justify that, that number. Right. And we were caught in that. Yeah. And so it's kind of one of these things where you, in San Francisco at least, um, everybody wants to be the next Airbnb. And that's great. And very few firms end up doing that. But you, as a startup, you're, you're, you're faced with the challenge. Do I go ahead and give myself a valuation of, a, of an Airbnb? So if I do blow up, I retain my company? Or do I do a realistic, let's say, valuation? Um, but then if you turn out being an Airbnb, you've given out a substantial amount of your company for a really low price. And it also, you know, it, it does depend on the times, right? We've seen a lot of people are saying a bubble again, right? We've seen some inflated valuations, both in the private investment and also in IPOs and we work. public side. We work we is work getting destroyed right, yes. right now. And it does feel like it's settling down a little bit. So I think we are seeing it settle a little bit. And I think that'll apply to private investment as well. Yeah. Unless you have hockey stick growth. Then you're good. Yeah. Did you ever think about going public or was that ever a goal of yours or your, your, your co-founder? Not really. I think we were realistic in thinking early on that at least as the product stood there, that it probably wasn't the type of company that would be big enough to go public. Mm -hmm. Maybe we had grand visions of like, if this thing really blows up here, we could get into lending, we, you know, to buy inventory and things like that. We could do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And in that case, yeah, that could be a big company to, to take public. But now our strategy was really, um, we thought this would be um, super valuable to um, another strategic, larger company at some point. Did you ever have rounds of funding or did you just get the investment as needed? You said you basically had angel uh, investors. Yeah, it was kind of weird. <laughs> we kind of fudged it and like did what we had to do. Sure. Our rounds, our tranches really would come in at like, you know, two or 300 K at a time. Okay. So we would, we got 250 from, from idea lab plus some angels and then we'd go, that would last us for a little while. Yep. And then when we're getting close to running out of money, we'd go talk to some angels again and kind of put together a round idea lab would put another 50 and that's so awesome. We'd, that's we'd like get another like 250 or 300 or something. So we'd call it series C round two. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a couple of those, so and then we had a couple of our existing angels decided they liked what we were doing because I would send our investors updates every month or every quarter. Yep. And we had pretty good growth. I mean, it wasn't hockey stick growth, but it was like up steady, the right, steady. Yeah. Every month. That's all you can add. That's that's good growth. Yeah. Yeah. Like no Upwards. down months at all. Like, Directionally correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so some of our angel investors um, opened it up, opened up a syndicate on AngelList. Okay. We trying to raise money. So we did two angel list rounds. And what well. year? So angel list launched 2008, I think something like that. Yeah. I mean, and this was way later. This was, we did one, I'm trying to think back, it's sort of a blur now. We did one in probably 2016 and one in 2017. Oh, okay. So re fairly recently. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And it worked out. It worked out. Yeah. We raised a couple hundred bucks. A couple hundred thousand. I mean, a couple hundred thousand <laughs> yeah. bucks. Uh, I think for it to be successful, you need to have somebody leading it that has a reputation. Yes. Of delivering, you know, on, very much the case. Yeah. yeah. So we had, fortunately, we had two of those uh, already as angel investors, and so they they helped us out there. And so then you go, you're at ten people. When do you decide to get your own office space? Yeah, it was right around then. We started feeling like in Idea Lab, while it was great. The way I describe it is, we went from dining room table, which is kind of like living with mom, to Idea Lab, which is kind of like having roommates, mm. to getting our own house like where we could paint the walls black if we wanted to. Right? Yeah. That's what it felt like is that it was an awesome, fun place to be, but we really couldn't have our own culture or style. There. One of the things that Y Combinator emphasizes is you giving your, your own office because of the culture component. And so yeah. there's different models or theories out there, but the hardest thing about a shared space is the culture piece, right? You can't sort of, to your point, you can't, if you want a basketball hoop, you can't do it. If you want a ping pong table, maybe it's there, but it's shared. Yeah. If you want kombucha or an espresso machine and it's not available, you're taking a walk to a right. local coffee shop. 
Right. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're having tons of fun, right? So you know, a young team and we're doing things like air horn pranks where you take the air horn out of their chair, right? And they sit on it. And, and so the day I knew it was time to leave is when we did an air horn prank to one of our employees and it was like 8.30 in the morning and he sat on it and it blasted inside of Idea Lab so loud and we got yelled at by one of the other founder CEOs because oh. he was on a call. Mm. Like, Guys, go on. All right. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's time it's to go. Time. Yeah. We get our own space to have That's fun funny. and do what we want. It sounds like your culture was coming through at that time. Totally, That's, yeah. yeah. And I mean, we're not all, you know, we're working. <laughs> but we just wanted to fun. So, but we looked for a long time. We knew we wanted to stay in Pasadena. Actually, first we looked downtown. Okay. And we decided, no, we want to stay in Pasadena. By that point, we had, I forgot what it was. It was like 10 or 12 people, but... You know, they're all kind of lived in that area. So we didn't want to move to the west side and probably lose most of the people. Um, we wanted to stay there. And so we were looking for a, for a good year, probably. Okay. Um, until we found a place. And again, because we hadn't raised a lot of money, we didn't have a ton of money to put down as a deposit. You know, most of the landlords wanted five-year term. It was a lot of raw space. So they were going to do a build-out, but they <clears> wanted <throat> five years and, and six months deposit personal guarantees and we're like can't do that we don't have the money we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years but we we had a broker that was helping us out and he found this really awesome move-in ready place behind a bar um it's like 4600 square feet Big. totally built out yeah multi-leveled with conference rooms and it was just it was cool and right in old town pasadena and they only wanted one month deposit and the rent was like 40 percent below what? market because wow. they had a tenant in there that moved out and they just wanted to fill to, it to fill it same rate like somebody super easy that would come in not give them a lot of trouble because their bar we're, we're subleasing actually from the bar so oh, okay they're bar owners they don't want to deal with tenants right they just want to make some money on the back of this building that they leased out so this is why we work exist like if you're a startup and you're signing a five-year lease and there's 10 employees if you're a successful startup, you probably have 40 people, 50 people, 100 people in year five. Yeah. And so then you end up subleasing it. But for some reason, the market still wants you to sign this five-year lease. It doesn't make any sense, right. right? And so then WeWork figured it out and we see why their model has been successful because of the flexibility. But so you move in and there's 10 of you in a 4,600 square foot yeah, spot. Yeah, it's like 10 or 12. I can't remember exactly, but yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of it was two conference rooms actually three, like three conference rooms. Um, we had one space in there that couldn't really do anything but make it like either a closet or like, like a phone did, booth room? a quiet space. We needed oh. a meditation room. Okay. So it didn't have any windows or anything. It's just this like little <laughs> space. And uh, it had, well, it had like a glass door window to the inside, but nothing to the outside. Um, and I'd always wanted to have like a quiet space or meditation space, so got that and then we hired a meditation coach as well from the beginning so from the beginning is one of the first things we did yeah. wow we still have do through. all your employees get let's talk about meditation all right what is your so you it sounds like you've been on a journey right otherwise it was it a would, journey for sure uh i had an old roommate that i lived with that would meditate and loved it and i was always super interested and wanted to learn what it was about and how to do it and how do you know you're doing it right and yeah wasn't good at teaching me that um he would bring me to like root meditations and stuff and i would kind of sit there but i just never knew if i was doing it right like what am i supposed to be doing what am i supposed to be feeling right did something click for you or you just you started no. to absorb the stillness i guess not it didn't or, or the, didn't the, the really muting of your thoughts until we got the coach actually so oh, wow okay yeah i mean i tried a few times and i just for some reason really knew that i wanted to learn it and like wanted to be part of my life I saw the results in other people, but I just did not know what to do. And this is before like Headspace or any of the Calm or any of those apps were. were right. Around. And randomly I met, uh, at an event, I met a woman who asked if we wanted like leadership coaching because that's what she did. And I said, no, but I'm looking for meditation coaching. If you know anybody, she's like, actually I have a guy for you. So this guy, Nick Stein, who's awesome, used to be a film producer. I think he wants to me. So he produced the show Border Wars on Nat Geo, like one of their top grossing shows, and found meditation because he was really struggling with what he saw on the board. And 
the, the trauma, wow. from, like what he experienced for four years. And it was basically ruining his life. And so he, through a therapist, found meditation and loved it and quit being a producer. And now mostly teaches meditation, mindfulness practices to law enforcement who need it the most. That's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. And he does some corporate stuff. We're the first company he did it for. And does he, is it group sessions or is it one on one? Group session. Okay. Whoever wants to go. I only required everybody to go to the first one <laughs> to learn about it. Yeah. I'm like, just show up. If you don't like it, you never have to come back. What a great but CEO. We, we have probably half the company does it, depending on who's busy. You know. In the morning? Or is there a preferred like time? 11 o'clock he comes. Okay. So that's kind of what we found was like morning people want to get their emails checked and stuff. Right. So this is kind of like after that first wave. Of catch up. Of catch up and it's on a Friday. So it's already a little bit slower. Yeah. What are your quick highlights on meditation? How have you been able to, I guess, let's talk about how you figured it out and then the quick benefits that you've seen. So I figured out that mindfulness meditation in particular, which is what we practice, is about awareness of your awareness. It's really what the best way to describe it. Being aware of your thoughts. It's not about trying to smash all your thoughts down and have an empty mind. It's about sitting still and being present with your with what's happening now. So it doesn't even need to be a super quiet place because we can use the sounds around you or mm-hmm. things that are happening around you to sort of... Uh, draw you into the present moment but it's really just you know people focus on like breathing and then inevitably your mind is going to wander yeah and it's about recognizing what you're thinking about and recognizing those thoughts and then just kind of gently bringing it back to focusing on your breath or you know there's different te- techniques but for me it really helps sort of ground me and in particular when i'm feeling like overwhelmed with a lot of stuff to do and don't know where to start <laughs> right that's when i'll go sit and it sort of just is a reset for me and it really helps me focus and reduce stress that's great yeah. i've been doing it um in the morning sometimes yeah. so if i have so the subconscious lives in my dreams it turns out and uh so i have conversations with it but when i wake up so the normal tendency i used to have is i wake up and i go right to my phone and i just start going into action totally. right and that's how you fix your bad dream of your stress. And so what I've been, <laughs> yeah, you know this? Yes. Yeah. And so what I've been doing is um, I'll, t- I'll like sit and think about the dream and I'll sort of talk to it, talk to that, that energy that was in the dream. And I don't touch my phone and I never wear an Apple watch whenever I sleep because of this, because then your notifications just start crushing you in the morning. And so then I just think about it and then I sort of have the meditation time and then I, I sort of quiet that voice. Then the next voice wants to enter the room, right? Of like, all right, we got to get all this done. Let's go. And then I just live in that space for as long as I can. I, I try. I don't really put a, a time limit. Obviously, the longer, the better for me. But usually it's a quick five, 10 minute thing. That's all you need. Yeah. And then I get up and I'm like, all right, that was good. Yeah. And then I'm, I'll grab my cell phone. I don't always do it, but sometimes when things are very stressful. It's hard to be disciplined. It's just like, you know, go to the gym. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to keep that discipline. Let's talk about the acquisition. So, okay. are there many people coming to you? Is it? Are you thinking of selling, or are people approaching you about buying your company? What What was that like? Yeah, so got to the point in like probably late 2017, 2018, when my co-founder and I were thinking about, you know, okay, what what does the future look like for us? You're six, seven years in. The seven year itch is here. Yeah, actually, you know, from Idea Lab point when we started full time we're about five years in at that point so maybe, okay yeah, about five years in at that point and we were thinking okay so this space is getting more competitive we have you know the landscape looks way different than when we started we have more competitors doing this we are either going to need to raise money seriously raise money like, mm. to stay competitive to, to become stay, a player to or grow, like plant your flag yeah yeah to really scale and take this to the next level yep or join a strategic partner that we can add more value and like as one would be even more valuable right so we're kind of looking at both of this those is why people say one plus one equals three sometimes yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is exactly that totally. yeah yeah so we were thinking about what to do and right around that time we did have some inbound um interest okay it's kind of and were your investors helping with this or is it not the investor so much as the board um, okay. Although we did, I, so we did have one. Let's see, when did I 
Armando come on. We had Armando was one of our angel investors who was also a successful entrepreneur. He sold his company at Espresso to Hootsuite. Okay, and awesome. when he was looking at my monthly or quarterly investor updates, he saw very similar trend to, to where at, uh, at Espresso was, his company was like two years prior. Kudos to Armando for actually looking at investor yes. updates. Yes, exactly. That's so appreciated. Like, so many people don't. Familiar, and I think I can help these guys because he was basically in charge of their growth engine. Okay. And so he reached out and we started talking about this side, side note here, but we started talking about, you know, him coming on as an advisor, almost like a super advisor, almost a part-time COO. Sure. That level. Like yep. Not just everybody Setting talks you up about for advisors the... and they never hear from him again. This was like, we're going to meet twice a week. He lives in San Francisco. So we're going to jump on a, you know, a Google hangout or something twice a week, mm -hmm. go through our financials, go through our strategy. And like, he's going to work with us to help us grow. So that actually happened. That was one of the angel list syndicates too. So he did a Got syndicate. It. He raised some money. He came on as his advisor and he helped us out a ton. Now he's kind of packaged this up and is helping some other companies too. Which yeah. Is really cool. So he helped a ton in sort of with this strategy as well as our board. And Mike and I realized and, and thought about it and said, okay, well, if we raise VC money now, we're basically committing to at least another five years. Right? Mm -hmm. To grow the company to the size that the return would be good enough for the VCs. The VCs, yeah. Probably five years. Maybe at least three, right? Yeah. So do we want to do that? We're starting to see more and more competition. We're seeing companies that we partner with, you know, traditionally have partnered with like Shopify, now launch their own Amazon and eBay integration. So they become frenemy almost. Like are they competing? Are they not? We still do very well and, and have a great partnership with Shopify. That's but, fascinating. So they're we're starting, starting to see more and more of that. Like other the writing's on the wall. Consolidation of the market. Yep. This is becoming not a nice to have anymore. It's becoming a must have. Right. Um, for the big players to stay competitive. Players, yeah. yeah. And so that makes perfect it sense. Felt like okay, joining forces with a bigger company makes more sense than trying to go at this alone. And so rather than pursuing investment, we looked at that and it's. Right at that same time, we had GoDaddy reach out to us and say, hey, uh, most people know us for domains and hosting because that's what we've done. Yeah. But we are now in a position where we're launching tools to help everyday entrepreneurs be successful online. And we launched this website builder and it has online store product. So you can launch and set up your online store super quickly. Uh, we have all these other tools too, like scheduling if you're a hairdresser or something like that, or we can sell digital goods. We can sell, not even just sell, but you can spin up a website really quickly. You can uh, do bookkeeping. Like we have all these tools for, for entrepreneurs and we see that the major gap is this marketplace integration and you guys do it better than anybody else for small businesses. And so we would love to have you build a white label solution for us where you are powering it. Oh, interesting. It. Okay. An online store. So we said, okay, and we, we've never done that before, but we started going down that path and working on the deal with them. And is this taking away all your tech resources? Not or? all of them, no, but it, a we majority? definitely tabled some other priorities that we had. Yeah. We thought this was going to be big. We thought this could, I mean, we're, at that point, we weren't necessarily even thinking acquisition. We were just right. thinking like strategic plan. massive growth engine for us where we can just you know have a huge lead funnel of, of yep. many customers. But pretty quickly, their corp dev team, came forward and said, hey, you know, we see these kinds of heavy technical partnerships work better for one company. Hmm. Um, how, how far into the integration did they ask? We haven't even started building yet. We were okay, still so it's pretty early on. The negotiation part, still working through some of the contract stuff. And what we weren't ready to sell yet, uh, Mike and I, and this was 2017, so we said, we held them off and said, well, you know what, let's just focus on the partnership for now. And they said, great, well, if you ever want to have the discussion again, let us know. So the partnership, we'd signed the deal. That took months to get legal. Absolutely. All that. Yeah. Signed the deal, started working on the actual technical integration in 2000, early 2018. And it took us about six months. So late 2018, um, we were ready to launch. And at that point, we started getting some other interest, inbound interest coming in. And so we reached out to GoDaddy again and said, hey, we're interested in having that conversation again. 
took that, you know, that went on for a while. In the meantime, we had launched the white label integration and it did really well. We got thousands of GoDaddy sellers. But you were, you knew, right, right? You knew that you had to, you had to make it pop. You, like you had yeah, to get it right. Of course, they're interested. Yeah. Of course. And then of course, you know, they want to, when we came back, they're like, well, let's, let's see how the integration does first. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, no problem. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're getting other inbound hits. What a yeah, perfect, I mean, it was kind that's of, amazing. It wasn't like super aggressive at the time, but we had some interest and, but when it started heating up, we had the discussions uh, with GoDaddy and a few others and ultimately, and were you pretty candid with them? We were, we didn't, t- you know, we had NDAs. We didn't sure. You wouldn't say the name. Was totally. What the amounts were or anything, but we were getting other offers. Yeah. The company. Um, but ultimately, you know, for us, Mike and I, the culture of who we were going to join was super important. How they were going to treat our employees was super important. The great thing is that we had just got to spend a year plus working with GoDaddy, both on the biz dev side, people who would be end up being my boss, um, the technical side, and we loved it. Our engineers said, you know, of all the partners we've worked with, this has been the best, and we just really loved the opportunity on Go at GoDaddy because they have this 19 million customers already from the domains and hosting side. Yeah. And this huge, you know, they're still one of the biggest domain providers in the world. And so most people, when they, when you're an entrepreneur and you come up with an idea, the first thing you do is name it and go buy a domain name. And most people go to GoDaddy. That's true. So it's a huge lead gen for them. Huge, massive competitive advantage over their competitors. Yeah. And this, you know, their whole, what was called Go Central at the time, which is now this uh, websites plus marketing suite that they have with email marketing and all of other stuff was really exciting to me and Mike to be a part of that growth kind of felt startup y in mm-hmm. a way. They were mm-hmm. really scrappy getting this thing going. So when you signed the paperwork, did you throw a big party? You tell your whole team what was we the did. yeah that was, that was fun. That was super stressful actually because you know you taking care of your employees is actually very difficult in it an is. acquisition. And I think a lot of people don't um there's been an uh, there's a lot of horror stories that don't get told enough but sometimes the employees are put on i would say like a four-year golden handcuff or sometimes a three-year golden handcuff but then they're 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 fired in year two mm-hmm. yeah. and so they never get the payout and this is never told yeah. to anybody but this happens all the time and then what ends up happening is it goes an hr from the buying company will pay these people not what they were supposed to get but a percentage of it just to keep quiet and not effectively get negative press. But it sounds like not the case for you, which is wonderful. That will not happen here. GoDaddy acquires a lot of companies. We were the 24th company in the last five years, I think, that they've acquired. Wow. And we were able to speak to a lot of founders from prior acquisitions before signing with them and all heard great things. And, you know, it's kind of like for them. That's great. It's the reputation is important, right? Um, totally. It's almost like a VC. VCs don't sign NDAs. Uh, you know, famously don't sign NDAs, and people are worried that VCs are going to steal their idea. <laughs> it's like that's not going to happen because they'll never do another deal ever. If right? They know if their integrity is. I've harsh. seen I've seen VCs uh, defend the worst of CEOs to my face because they that's their party. It's almost like talking to a politician, and they'll just say, "We stand behind all of our founders." We believe they're always yeah. doing the right thing and we'll always do that. And if any stock becomes available in the company, we'll gobble it up because we're, yeah. you know, we, we believe big time these people will succeed. Right. And I'm right. always like, wow, that's, that is not true at all. But I love the commitment to the cause because they know the reputation yeah. is so huge. Yeah. And then in GoDaddy's case, they want to continue to acquire companies. And so they know if they growth by acquisition or a bunch of former founders, that word is going to get out and we'll never acquire right. a company again. Right. So you have a big not party? That they want it. I mean, they're good people. So they're not yeah, no. they won't do that anyway. But it's nice to but hear. But there is, you know, there is a incentive for them not to do that as well because it would ruin their business. Yeah. So we retained all of our employees. Everybody uh, did well. In the, you know, every employee had stock options. Brian uh, Nolan, CEO of the year. That's so nice. <laughs> no, I'm and, serious. And, like, we, and, you know, most importantly, we retained everybody. That was very big for us. My this is a very uncommon not, story. You're not going to lay off anybody. Yeah. So if you need to have that, then including the meditation, including the meditation coach. <laughs> the hardest part, though, was you know GoDaddy is a public company, so yes. you have to keep it very quiet during the due diligence period. 
leading up to it, even from our employees. So do our they, employees do they, did not know until the day of when we told them. Did they send a team in to do any IT type of network security stuff? Yes, a little bit. Or like a so training, we we'll call it? To, I mean, they came in. Fortunately, we had the partnership. So they were coming in for the part, like the business right. leaders were coming in for the partnership side of things and even the tech leaders. But during due diligence, which was six or seven weeks before closing, uh, for that whole time, which was one of the most stressful things I've ever <laughs> gone through in my life. Um, we did have one point where we had to tell a couple of our technical leads about the acquisition because they had to do with a technical due diligence. Yes. And Mike and I could not. So Mike and Mike, you, you and Mike are not technical. In you know, I started my career as a software engineer. So okay. I consider myself technical, I'm like a product guy, Yep. but I am no longer writing code. I cannot walk you through our code and tell you what's going on. So we needed somebody very technical to do that. So yeah. we did have to, near the end, let a few people know, but most of the team did not know. And we had planned a big party. It was actually really fun because- I believe Super it. stressful. So we closed it on a Wednesday, I believe. I think April 10th was a Wednesday. And even up until like that last weekend, we were negotiating little fine points of the deal. And but we still needed to leave enough time for all of our investors to sign off on this. So, right. I mean, it's a massive packet of paper. How many signatures did you need in total? We needed um, probably about fifteen or so. Yeah. Maybe more, something like that. And so we had to give our investors a heads up of like, hey, this is coming, so be ready. And then we send it out on a Sunday, and it has to be back by Tuesday, so we can close on Wednesday. I mean, it was just like. Mm -hmm. tracking down everybody they're all across the country in the world like some are on vacation like it was it was gnarly and we planned a big party so we had the whole this whole event space we had like 20 people from GoDaddy come down in secret hiding uh throughout the day because we made the announcement to the team after the markets closed because GoDaddy's public so. totally which is nice to be on the west coast yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and uh but we did a little even a little bit later we did like at three o'clock because we just wanted to give the rest of the day to go party do you make the announcement? Or like, yeah. You're on recorded. the microphone. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, we were secretly recorded it. So we had swag, go to the swag. We had all kinds of stuff set up. A whole like party with champagne at a at a bar nearby with champagne and food and a bunch of Not your landlord, points. but a different bar. Totally, yeah. <laughs> landlord bar is a, a fun sports bar. But sure, we sure. We went to like a nicer place. But working with the PR team at GoDaddy was really cool because they had like, a, they call it a TikTok, right? Down to the minute of, we are going to tell the, uh, team at three o'clock at three o five the press release is going to go out at three ten this is going to happen at three eleven this is going to happen and it's like boom when we rehearsed it like it was it was fun and is your phone going nuts at some uh, point it, it, it did after that yeah but it was fun telling the team because we have wow. monthly that's so cool. uh, all hands meetings where uh, town halls we call them right where we just sure. kind of like review what's going on with the company and so we set it up like that Mike and I set it up like monthly town hall for April and we started going through some of the metrics and celebrating. We had hit a revenue milestone actually just before that. So we're kind of celebrating it's that. It's pretty amazing. All, the, all of this coming together. Yeah. And talking through how we got to that revenue milestone. And then we kind of said, well, you know, we got to that and that you know, everybody already knew about the, the partnership that we had with GoDaddy. So we said, we got to that revenue milestone without even considering the revenue that's going to come from the partnership. And this is how cool that partnership is. This, these are some of the commercials that GoDaddy has been doing for this online store and everything. And we played some really cool video spots that GoDaddy produced and getting everybody kind of hyped up. It's like fast paced music and these videos and everything. And then uh, said, wouldn't it be really cool if, uh, if we all were working together? I forgot exactly what I said. Something to the effect of like, if we're all, if we join this company and we're yeah, all working if together. if you were one. And then it was like quiet. Like, <laughs> and then we announced that we've been acquired and it was people were like it took a moment people were shocked super happy a couple people were crying like in in happiness of course and uh we were coached very well to say you know the first thing you need to make sure you say after that is don't worry you all have your jobs nobody's yeah. getting fired yeah because that's people are waiting for it and right. they're not going to hear anything else until they hear that. What's tomorrow look like? Yep. Yeah. And uh, so we said that and reiter reiterated that. Same office. Times. Everything's good. 
higher yeah. pay. And by the way, we have 20 GoDaddy people waiting to party with you. So let's go. Pack up. We're going. Really? Yeah. It was That's fun. so amazing. It was fun. It was really fun. I feel inspired after that story. <laughs> Good for you. That's cool. Yeah. Is it addicting? Do you want to do it again? <laughs> I, I actually do. I actually do. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. And what's it so like? I'll be there for a couple. All of us, you know, we're all sitting on. I'll be there at least for a couple of years. We're all, uh, we all have two years worth of product milestones that we still are working on. Okay. So you're, um, you're, you have to fulfill your obligations on the roadmap. Yep. For yep. two, two years? For two years is okay. the, is the minimum, sort of the minimum with the, with the golden handcuff period, I guess. Yeah, it's not really. I mean, nobody's locked down. Everybody would still do it. Okay, I got gotcha. you. You know, you could leave and still be fine. But, yeah. Um, but there is some incentive to stay. So, and and we like working together. The stuff we're working on is really cool. We have way more opportunity and more resources now as part of a bigger company as we expected. The whole reason we did this. Right. Um, so we have some really exciting things coming up. What are the accounting challenges that go with this switching everything over? That's the big thing. One really cool thing they did was have our payroll and benefits and everything done. We helped them get it all in loaded up. So as of the day of the acquisition, the very next day, it just turned we're on. Wow. Go ahead and payroll with their, they had their, all their benefits people there. So they were there, they were there for like three days after. Of course. All their benefits people were there helping us select and sharing all the cool new benefits we get and things like that. So immediately we were in their system on that. Accounting is just now mm. rolling over. So, so it's like you're in due diligence time. all over again, kind of. Yeah. I mean, going through every single vendor and supplier. Contract. And how we pay everybody. Are they on credit card, auto bill, or are we paying invoices and all that stuff and getting it moved over. And What's the plan for that? Is it like a three to six month like sunset period, I guess, or... So for the financials? Specifically. Yeah, and even the brand, but for the um, financials specifically. So for the financials, yeah, it's uh, yeah, we had a goal of getting it done within a certain time frame. That was that's the longest. Yeah, um, that's complicated. We should be all good to cut over on October first, which is oh, that's a few days away. That's amazing. Yeah. And in terms of um, the brand, brand, yeah. So the intention for now is to leave the brand as is and continue. So we have. Our standalone Cellbrite product, which is continuing to run and grow and operate just like it always has. And we have mm -hmm. all those customers still. And we still also have the GoDaddy online store version of our product, which is built into their okay. online store. So we support both of these. So the cool thing is that GoDaddy is not forcing anybody to use their online store product. If you still want to use Shopify, you're most likely a GoDaddy customer anyway because you bought your domain from GoDaddy. Um, Correct. Yeah, but you can still go use Shopify, and they're perfectly happy selling you the for us selling you know selling you the um, standalone Cellbrite branded product. So we really like that too. That we didn't have to get rid of our brand. Now you know, in the future, they may decide to change that into a building sure. branded product, which I'm fine with. But there, we do have brand equity in the space. Um, yeah, and we're known. How has it helped or even and maybe hurt with some of the, like Amazon or does it strengthen the brand now? Are they like, oh, wow, they've been acquired. This is great. Or is it, how do they view does, it? does, yeah. I okay. Mean, obviously a lot more um, clout, if you will, to, you know, to have a GoDaddy biz dev person reach out to Amazon than a sell right person. Yeah. Um, we already had pretty good partnerships. Actually, in some cases, we had better partnerships than GoDaddy did for like eBay, for instance. Oh, amazing. We so were already helped. a strategic partner with eBay. And so we brought that to the table and we just renewed that as part of GoDaddy now. Um, but yeah, they've definitely opened doors for us with other, with Amazon in particular is hard to get into. Any other pitfalls or any other hard parts of the acquisition? For me personally, it's different because I'm now pulled into other meetings and I have a boss and I have, so, you know, I have reporting to do and I don't not like it, but it's just different. It's a different thing. It's yeah. different than what I've been doing for six years. So it's a little bit of adjustment there. I think for most people on the team, it's business as usual. Just I mean, really more for the leadership now. We have to navigate. I know there's nine thousand people at GoDaddy wow. in the world. By the way, seven thousand of those are their help, their care team. They call them so the support. Help, support wow, helping customers. Yeah. So it's you know it's navigating the work structure and who to go to for different things. And but yeah. they're super helpful with that. I mean, they've been great. What's next for uh, your? So, so two years from now, 24 months, 36 months from now, what's, yeah, what, do you, know, what, do you, what been, space do you want to get into? Same space, the e-commerce space? I'm, I've been super interested in like the D2C, direct-to-consumer side of things with 
you know, companies like Warby Parker is one of the originals, but now like Airbird, uh, Allbirds, and um, I can't remember. Oh, there's so many. But like, but there's, yeah. yeah, there's so many. I mean, it's kind of a cool space, and there's something about working with technology and a physical product that I think is interesting to me. Yeah. And I've had a few people come, of course, reach out and ask for investments already <laughs> or ask to, you know, to show me some decks. And um, <laughs> so I'm, see, I'm starting to see some cool stuff. I mean, I don't have any crazy, like, super exciting idea that I have come up with yet, but we'll see. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, yeah, Brian. this is great. Where can people find you? Cellbrite, GoDaddy? All of the above, yep. We still have, you know, we're still at Cellbrite.com. I'm, I'm Brian at Cellbrite.com is my email, or bnolan at GoDaddy.com. Um, we're here in the Pasadena, California area. Look me up. Yeah. Go oh, grab coffee or a drink. Well, thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. We here at Start of the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Make sure to give us a rating on iTunes. Anything over five stars is the only way to go. Our music is composed by Double Touch. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Start of the Storefront. For more information on the products and businesses featured on the show, check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.